Good evening, saints. Happy Sabbath. I want to give glory to God, and I want to thank all of you that are gathered this evening. I also want to thank the Lord for those who will be hearing us uh, through the social media. I want to bring greetings from North Carolina, from my family, and some of the people that knew that I will be here. And I want to continue to invite all of those that have been with us throughout this week. And I trust that God has spoken to you. And the same Lord will not fail us tonight as we gather at his feet. And so this evening we are talking about family dynamics during cultural crack, during cultural transition. Family dynamics during cultural transitions. And tonight I want to talk about when there is a new pharaoh. When there is a new pharaoh in the land. Let me invite each one of us to go with me as we read from Exodus. Exodus chapter 1, verse 1. What I like to be able to talk about tonight is to be able to understand the role of the family during promotion and in support of mental health, particularly during periods of cultural change. The next thing I like us to talk about also is to explore the challenges and the opportunities that may come from intergenerational communication. And finally, we will look at mitigating those acculturational stress and fostering growth. So turn with me to the book of Exodus chapter 1. Verse 1, the Bible says, And now these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt, each man and his household, from the house of Jacob. The Bible begins in the book of Exodus by giving us the genealogy of the children of Jacob. And how God in his strength lifted them up. Seventy souls related from the des descending from the house of Jacob. Of course, excluding you know, all the, non the, the married women including also the wife of Jacob. But what is very interesting is that later on, when they reach Elim, God gives them 70 palm trees and 12 wells. But before we go there, let's continue. Verse 5, it says, All these are descendants of Jacob, 70 persons in all. Of course, Joseph was already in Egypt. And Joseph died. And all his brothers and all that generation. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. There are times when God prospers you. And at moments like that, not only you, you become a blessing to the land, but a threat as well. And so when the children of Israel had moved into this foreign land, and when you move into a foreign land and God begins to bless you, sometimes you begin to be a threat to somebody. That is why you sometimes see polarizations even in this land once we arrive and the God prospers you. But now in verse 8, and there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. When there is a new pharaoh who did not recognize and give credit to Joseph. It was less than a hundred years after Joseph had died. So it doesn't mean that this new pharaoh did not know Joseph. But was not willing to give credit where credit is due. 
This is when immigrants are looked at with suspicion and fear. This is when somebody is threatened and begins to systematically include everybody in their own anxiety and psychosis. This is when, because God has prospered you, somebody begins to be threatened. And I wonder sometimes as immigrants, when you reach a foreign land, that you begin to feel that every eye is looking at you, but, but all is not well. It is within this time that we go to verse two, chapter 2, verse 1. And there was a man in the house of Levi that took a wife, a daughter of Levi as well. And the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she took the ark of bulrushes and dabbed it with asphalt and pitch and put the, put the child in it and laid it in the reeds in the river bank. And his sister stood afar off to see what will happen of him. It is during this time that Moses is born. And when Moses is born, it is a time of a crisis and turmoil. Because when you go back to chapter 1, Pharaoh began to have a systematized plan of racial discrimination to undermine and disenfranchise this new nation that is growing up. He made them work so hard by setting taskmasters over them. Verse 11. And when they were actually made to work harder in under circumstances and employment conditions that were unbearable, yet the Lord continued to bless them. Do you realize sometimes that uh, for some strange reason, you are the one that seems to get some of the heaviest patients. And you begin to wonder whether it is all by chance. And you begin to realize that no matter how hard you work, somehow your work, the Lord keeps increasing and you're not only finishing the work that you're doing, but you have so much work to do later. Sometimes I sympathize with the nurse practitioners who have to sleep at two o'clock in the morning trying to chat some of the patients that they were not able to finish. While at the same time, you're dealing with a situation where the patient is asking you, I want to see my doctor. Can you go call my doctor? And you're trying to say, but, but, but I am the doctor. And they say, uh-uh, no, no. Uh, I don't want any black thing touching me. Go, go call my doctor. And uh, sometimes you're forced to go and uh, look for the CNA to talk to them and uh, communicate the same thing that you had told them. And then they will be able to accept the medication you've given. Moses is born during such a time. And when that did not work, the anxiety went up even a notch higher. And so the midwives were told and given a presidential directive to kill every child that was a male born to the Hebrew minds. But somehow the Lord touched the wives the midwives of Egypt, and they could not be able to undertake the command of the Pharaoh. And so when all this did not work, then there was a presidential death decree that all the boys be killed. This infanticide was supposed to target Moses and his compatriots. And what we begin to notice here is that by the time Moses is born, all men are in hiding. When you read the whole of chapter 2, you do not get to know the name of the man 
Neither do you know about his brother. But you hear about two women, Jacobeth and Miriam. But you don't hear the name of Amram and Aaron until chapter 18 of Genesis. Of Exodus. You begin then to realize at that point that all the men had been forced to go under and to be in hiding. And so when Moses is born, it is at the time that it is so dangerous to be a man in Egypt, particularly a younger male that could be under the sword. Yes, you know the story. Moses is found by the daughter of Pharaoh who quickly is given bowels of mercy, adopts the boy, and Miriam is quick as a whip, hatches the plan to have a Hebrew nanny to take care of him. Fast forward, and Moses is grown. He is four. And he notices around that in the whole entire Hebrew camp, he is the only boy. There's no any other boy running around. All are females that are around his age. And slowly, through the grapevine, he found out people look at him suspiciously. Some with hostility and anger. And he begins to understand that boys were killed. And he was not supposed to be alive. He notices girls fighting over him. But also defending him. And he sees the injustice that women are going through. How they are treated by the taskmasters. And other Egyptian boys. And he realizes that the hostility that he's receiving. And when he turns around, all eyes look away from him. Because people are angry that he's the only one that survived. And somehow, some even implicated that their sons were killed because of him. Moses is told not to say who he is. Now our children sometimes come to a foreign land. And sometimes we try as immigrants to remind them who they are and whose they are. And every day we want them not to forget who they are. But sometimes they suffer for not forgetting who they are. But they also suffer when they remember who they are and when they choose to remember who they are not. For Moses remembers who he is and he suffers for it. For one day in chapter 2, he finds out a Hebrew fighting another Hebrew and he stands up and tries to tell them what's going on. But the previous evening, he had found a slave master whipping mercilessly his Hebrew brother. And before long, something in him stopped and it killed him. So the following day or a couple of days when he found these two Hebrews fighting, he stood to the one that was at fault and said, why are you doing this? He looked at him with anger and hostility and said, who made you a ruler over us? Or do you want to kill me the way you killed the Egyptian taskmaster? It is at that moment that Moses realized that the word had gone out. And when it reached the ears of Pharaoh, Moses was put on a hit list for him to be killed. And that is when he ran away. Verse 15. 
and Moses heard that this matter, when Pharaoh heard of this matter, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelled in the land of Midian, where he sat at the well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters. They came to draw water and they filled the droves of the water to give drink to the flock of their father. But the shepherds came and drove the girls away. Moses stood up and helped them to water their flock. I want us to pause a little bit. And I want us to go back and realize what is going on behind the scenes. When Moses was raised in Egypt, what had happened is that all throughout and surrounding the time of his birth was trauma. Very interesting research found out that during 9-11, the mothers that were on the first and second trimester of their pregnancies when the tower, tower number one and tower number two fell, they found very interesting levels of cortisol in the blood of the babies that were born thereafter. And they began to notice that when there is stress in the land and in the family, something happens to the fetus during that conception, especially in the first and the second trimester. But they found that 50% of all the children that were born at elevated levels of the stress hormone. Moses is not only born with high cortisol at this point, but he's also thrown into a river that for the last three months have been seeing boys, their bodies, dead bodies floating on the river Nile. And so he is floating in the same river where the dead bodies of his compatriots have been floating. And then finally decaying or being eaten by the fishes of the river. Luckily, in that tributary, there were no crocodiles like the rest of the other tributaries of the Nile. But Moses was able to pick up the trauma. Then he goes to, ride, to be raised in the house of Pharaoh as a third culture kid. A third culture kid is one that is not a a typical Kenyan, neither an American, because he was born in Africa and raised in the U.S. We call them third culture kid. My research is looking at 1.5 generation. Those are those that were born and were raised in Kenya until age six, and then continued their growth in the U.S. So I'm looking at this 1.5 generation because you know, their parents and their older brothers and sisters come here as first generation. And then their siblings that are born here are second generation Americans. But these are kind of half and a half. That's why I call them 1.5, third culture generation. Moses is born in the camp of Israel, but raised in the house of Pharaoh. And so he's beginning to deal with adjustment anxiety in the house of the king, especially when he's been told to hide who he is. Esther, who was called Adaza, is also told by Uncle Mordecai not to tell her true name. And every single day you have to look over your shoulder. When you begin to realize that I don't belong here, Neither do I belong to the camp of Israel. And then you begin to ask the question, who am I? Moses ends up in Midian. A land that was inhabited by the descendants of Abraham and Geturah. 
And so there is a mixed race of the blood of Ham and the blood of Shem. And so Moses falls in love with Zipporah, a colored girl. And you can see this later on when Aaron and Miriam are complaining about Moses marrying a Cushite, a colored girl. Racial discrimination, racism had continued and even consumed the house of Israel. Moses arrives at the well in Midian and sees the injustice of men against women. And something in him snapped when he remembered the girls that stood up for him and took him when he was the only boy in the camp of Israel. And Moses stood for them. Over the years, Miriam had dealt with these rascals. Being the oldest in the family of Jethro, had dealt with this masochism from this man for years. She was also a no nonsense woman. And he sees Moses, who was a military captain, the way he stood and fought those men and almost killed them. And he said, This is the man for me. But what they did not know is the trauma that was percolating under both of them. Moses and Zipporah get married. And for many times, I don't have time to talk about it, but many times we don't understand the trauma that was in the house of Moses. We think the pastor's house is the happiest house. But there was tension going on in the marriage of Moses. When wounds and trauma that had not been resolved was always erupting. When the triggers of pain and unresolved trauma is recurring in the life of Moses and also in the life of Zipporah. And the whole crisis comes head on when we reach Exodus chapter 4. Verse 24, they are on the way to Egypt. Moses has heard the voice of God. His anger issues had been subdued by Jehovah in the burning bush. When he was reduced from the military captain of the land of Egypt, with his PhD in military logistics and science. And in all kinds of zoology and botany. In all civil and mechanical engineering. In all that he had graduated from the Nile Valley University in Egypt. 40 years of schooling. Moses is sent to the Sinai campus extension campus of the Nile Valley University to babysit ship. What an internship attachment. When he has to deal with scorpions and dumb ship for another 40 years that Moses may not only learn but he may learn to unlearn then he could have to live another 40 years where he could have to learn. That is why somebody says the illiteracy of the 21st century is not those who do not know how to read or write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Yet in Exodus chapter 4 verse 24, it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met Moses. Oh, the Lord met him and sought to kill him. It doesn't help that we are using pronouns and we don't know who is talking to who. This is one of the most controversial verses in, to the theologian. 
it came to pass that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Who is him? And who is the Lord? Is the Lord Jehovah? And is him the Moses? Or is the Lord the enemy, the devil, wanting to kill Moses or wanting to kill his firstborn? Gerishon. Who is who? For remember before that Moses had talked about the battle of the firstborns. That God will kill the firstborn of Pharaoh. But the devil could not take it. And he wanted to kill the firstborn of Moses. And one of the issues of contention was circumcision. And finally it erupted. The war that had been going on between Moses and Zipporah came head on. Over the argument of the circumcision of this boy. For Moses being a Hebrew. And Zipporah coming from a Kushite. African connection. Their circumcision rights were done uh, later. Not when the baby was eight days old. That was the argument. I don't know whether Moses got a heart attack. Or a massive stroke at this point. But Zipporah knew why. And she jumped in verse 25, took a sharp flint and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet. Again, we don't know whose feet, Moses' feet, the baby's feet, or God's feet, or the Lord's feet. It's a big controversy going on there. That is when the stroke stopped. The attack stopped. Then, with anger, this lady finally says, surely you are a husband of blood to me. And so he let him go. And she said, you are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. And then, with frustrations of anger, she took the bleeding boy, threw him on her back, took the younger one, and went home to his father. And told Moses, he can go by himself. When Moses needed her the most. Sephora with a bleeding boy and the little one walked back all the way to Midian. And people think that the families of pastors are the happiest. Trauma was involved in this. Later on we realized the grandson of Moses. Jonathan quits church and sells himself for hire as a Levite to the Danites. And he uses the effort to be able to make money being paid to serve God. The wrong God. Even the grandson of Moses quits the church and joins forces with overpostacy to the point that the Bible is so embarrassed to call Jonathan the grandson of Moses. They call him the grandson of Manasseh. It's only when you read at the margins that it tells you the grandson of Moses. But it was so embarrassing to write the grandson of Moses. They would rather write the grandson of Manasseh. I ask tonight. What trauma is percolating under our families and our marriages? How much trauma have we brought from home coming here? How much trauma have we gone through and root coming to this country? How much trauma have we encountered when you landed in the U.S. and realized for the first time that you are black? Some of us didn't know that until we landed here and realized that everybody looks at you differently. You are terrorizing people in your village. Speaking the Queen's English. Because you are the only one that understood that language. Until you reach here and people are asking you. What did you say again? After three times of being asked. Then you begin to wonder. Where am I? You know a friend of mine. His wife had come to the US a long time ago. 
And then finally she had made enough money to be able to bring the family. They arrive in uh, Cairo, Egypt. And they are checked into this very expensive five-star hotel. Hey, they thought they had already arrived. When the father is so tired and he's gone to sleep, the boy and the daughter discover some things. Oh, they found in their room a free phone. And they call back Jamhuri. And they talk to their cousins. And they talk to their friends. And they called everybody else in the village who can come. For there was a free phone. And they talked until 2.30 in the morning. And then they went to sleep. The following day, they were supposed to leave very early to the airport. And they were trying to check out. And they are telling the father, you have a bill of $865 for the phone call last night. And he's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> And the father is looking at the boy and the girl and is like, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, we made a phone call to Kenya last night. And they say, okay, $865 for that phone call. And the father has to call the United States of America to say to the wife, look, we have a situation. Well, it was either they stay another day and pay for the hotel and pay for the cancellation of the ticket or send the children to the U.S. and have the husband go back to chop the potatoes in order they can be able to pay the $865. So sure enough, the son and the daughter were sent to the United States while the husband is detained as the wife is trying to be able to get money to pay not only the $865, but also money for the hotel, extra days of the hotel, and for rebooking another flight to the United States. So ending up using more than $1,500 to be able to bring here. Talk about an adjustment. Stress. En route to the U.S., the land flowing with milk and honey. Moses. Moses. Let me go back to the slides. What is going on when we talk about the dynamics, family dynamics during cultural transition? Let me ask you to go to the next slide, please. I want to tell you something. Something is interesting here. Moses is reminding us of the trauma that may be found in our midst. What if you arrive into this land as a girl or as a man and you're taking a class and they're talking about sexual abuse and trauma and you realize that growing up as a girl something had happened to you and uh, that was supposed to have been reported to the social services, but that is 35 years ago. When something had happened as you had gone to gather the firewood, and you had come home crying to your grandmother, they told you, what do you think? This is what we've all gone through. And so you have to hush, because we have to protect the clan and the tribe before the person that did it was either a cousin or or an uncle. What do you do when as a man you realized things you've gone through that are unresolved, that you didn't know what to do, but now you come here and for the first time everything in your life is triggered. As you go through racism, as you are stopped for driving, not under the influence, but while black. What do you do when you begin to deal with insinuations? And there is tension and uh, you are being accused of something that you did not know because you happened to go into a room as a CNA and somebody looks at the color of your skin and decides to put you in trouble. 
And it's only your, your word against us. What do you do when your son is serving time in jail for something he do not do, but because he could not get a fair representation? And so we have left, go back to the next slide. We have left that village. And as you left that village, you've arrived at a land where, let's go back to the previous one before I talk about that. Life was nestled within the tribe. And as long as you lived in that village, you had belongingness. You had purpose. You had transcendence. And the feeling that you are part of the connection between the ancestors and the living. So that you could, even seemingly blasphemous, you could say, I was, I am, and I will be. For you are told that you are the connection between the living dead. The many of the lives that were gone. And the connections of those that are yet to be born. Transcendence. And it also you are given stories to live by. For the name that you are given. Represented generations. That are gone and generations to come. And so when you are born. You are already told who you are. And who you are named after. And in many of the communities. Even an elderly grandpa could pay you back the money that they owed your grandfather. For they believe you are the embodiment of them. And now you arrive here. Let's see what the next side says. And not only are you hit with a rude shock. That you are not only, for some reason I think there is a double layering of that. You are moving from the feeling of I am because we are to we are therefore I am. But as you move here, you begin to realize, let's go to the next one. Don't worry about it. Let's go to the next slide. Then you begin to realize, next slide please. You begin to realize that you have to adjust that intergenerational communication. You have to adjust to the acculturating stress. And yesterday I talked about this. When you're dealing with opportunities, opportunity stress, you're dealing with communication stress, you're dealing with racial discrimination, you're dealing with all kinds of things, then you also begin to realize that your own children don't understand you. Because you talk English, Maybe not English, maybe a language similar to English. You know, you remember when Idi Amin Dada was trying to talk to the Queen. And the BBC announcer says, ladies and gentlemen, that is Field Marshal. Idi Amin Dada speaking a language similar to English. You know, when you're sitting on this table eating this mango, you realize that you are eating that mango in a different galaxy. For when you begin to eat that mango and the juice is going in between your fingers. You remember that mango tree back home in the village. Where your grandma used to sit and uh, below the chair was that dog Simba lying there. And, and there is a path that goes to the village well and your oldest brother is coming home. With cows and sheep. And there is the village singer. The village bum singing that Egugusi song. Coming home drunk. And oh, for a moment you are lost in thinking. Until you realize your daughter is looking at you saying. Dad what are you, what are you thinking about? And it's like you know. I'm thinking about all these stories of the past. And it's like I don't understand what you are talking about. Because to your daughter, he can only think about the aisle number three in Walmart. He doesn't know anything else about that mango. He is in aisle number three in Walmart while you are in Kenya thinking about the chinkororo. 
And then you realize that, man, you are, you are in two different galaxies communicating to each other and you're passing each other like ships in the night. Dealing with unresolved trauma. What do you do when somehow your wife's trauma is triggered and your trauma is triggered and you're trying to talk to your daughter or your son and they ask you why? Why should I do that? When they come home dressed in gothic and sucking up hand and doing all these kinds of things and you're like, I rest you better than that. And before you know what happened, it's a blackout. You send them rolling with a slap only to hear 911 uh, outside your house. And after three days in the room and uh, the judge tells you, you're no longer in Kenya, man. This is a different country. And now you don't know what to do. Next slide, please. What we realize in a foreign land is that the family dynamics have changed, particularly during this cultural change. For you realize that traditions and practices don't change over time. You begin to stand up and exert who you are. You know who I am if I was in Kenya right now? First of all, you're so privileged here. You didn't wear, you know, some of us didn't wear shoes until when we were in high school and they look at you and say, what's wrong with you? Was your father too poor to afford buying shoes for you? You know, you guys even just go in front of the house and you ride the bus. Some of us had to walk and we knocked our, our biggest toe, man. And, you know, I remember I lost a big toe uh, hitting those stones going running to school. And what was wrong with you? You, your father could not afford to buy a car? You, know, you look at it like, you know, they don't get it, man. You don't get what I'm talking about. Confusion and conflict. As to what kind of a lifestyle. And before long, you realize it's as if your wife seems to be taking side with their children. And because children are the fastest to acculturate, sometimes followed by women. And this guy is the only one wondering what happened. You know, they say there are those who make things happen. There are those who watch things happen and there are those who wonder what happened. And then now you are forced to reevaluate. You know, back in Kenya, you are sitting in rear left with a government driver. You are permanent and pensionable. When you arrive here, you can't even get a job. <laughs> maybe the, you're lucky to get a gas station or maybe a nursing home and it's only your wife and your daughters that I can be able to find a job. And you're supposed to sit home and babysit the baby. You've never changed that the diaper you're all your life. And uh, your, your sister-in-law is calling at the middle of the night. And your brother is calling in the middle of the night. And they say, can we, can we talk with the in-law? And he's like, ah, uh, he just stepped out a little bit. Because you are embarrassed to say that your wife is working at night while you sleep in the house. What kind of a chief brother is this? Who sleeps in the house while the wife goes to fight in the night? It's like you sit there and it's like, what, man, what? <laughs> oh, and then every night, you're just wondering, man, I, I wonder whether I'm a man or I, I turned into a woman. I don't know what kind of a goosey man am I. And then finally, children are asking questions. And you begin to wonder whether I am still a man or I am less than a man. Next slide. So as you begin to deal with this, then you begin to realize also that even your wife and your daughters and you are changing. For back home, you understood who you are. But here, you are questioning your identity. You don't know who you are anymore and who you are. For you have questions at home and questions at work and questions in the solitude of your own mind in the middle of the night and questions in the streets and stress and anxiety. And sometimes you wonder, 
What do I do because I just returned from the first shift and I'm supposed to go to the next shift and I only have an hour and a half to sleep. Until they tell you, you know, there is uh, something called melatonin. Uh, maybe it can help. And after some time, you realize it's not working and uh, somebody says, hey, um, um, you know, uh, there, is, there is something called Xanax. And there is uh, something else called, I don't know what. And uh, you're working in a nursing home where some of them are sometimes half asleep and sometimes dealing with dementia. They don't know whether they are in this world or the next. And it's like, well, the, one of the medications they are using can help. And before long, you're self-medicating as well. And before that, you begin to realize, even though I'm a nurse, but uh, it's helping sometimes. And before long, you are hooked to prescription drugs until they discover that the cameras are showing that uh, you are found uh, using the medications of the patients. And now you can stay without them. And then you realize maybe it's too expensive to buy them. And maybe the ones in the streets are not so bad after all. And before long, we are hooked into addictions that we do not know. And sometimes when you have been fired from work, when you're sitting there, there is nothing you can do. And then you begin to realize your husband is coming to bed late and late and late until you realize that he's married to another woman in the screen because he's dealing with porn. Then you begin to realize that uh, you're no longer the man for sure. Because when it's time to go home, you are beginning to think twice. Because things are not working the way you thought they were supposed to work. Because for years and years, you've been denied. And now when it is, the roles are reversed and you are now in your 50s, and 60s, the man is facing the other side and you're facing the other side. When it's been his turn, begging all these years, and now it's your turn. And things are not working. And you begin to wonder, what do I now do when there are two people almost of the same gender in the same bed? And you wonder, what happened? The system has worked on you. Stress has worked on you. Family dynamics during cultural transition. Let's look at the next slide. See, what is happening here is as we begin to deal with issues of unresolved stress and trauma, it begins to trigger so many things. Now, I'll talk more about this because I realize that maybe this, I don't know whether the slides are clearer to you. But when you have what we call intergenerational embodiment of historical trauma that have not been resolved over the years, then you begin to have local conditions and social conditions and local context where you found yourself dealing with racism and discrimination. Then it triggers adverse childhood experiences, ACEs. And I realized that for many people, 40 years later, the trauma that has been percolating under begins to come out as high blood pressure, come out as bouts of increased rates of diabetes, mental illness, cardiovascular diseases, all these kinds of things plus cancers that even include prostate cancers in men and in orgasmia and all kinds of things and all kinds of reactions of anxiety and depression and all kinds of complications and cancers in women associated with adverse childhood experiences and unresolved trauma, both historical, social, cultural, and environmental. Then there is now leading to disrupted neurodevelopmental circuits in the brain. 
that leads to early signs of Alzheimer's and dementia. Then you're dealing with adoption of risk behaviors to try to deal with a crisis in a foreign land. And even if when you go back home, you realize that a lot of this begins to come out. And you realize many people that have gone back home have had to deal with early signs of death, disease, disability, and social problems that leads to early death. Next slide, please. What I want to talk about is that when we arrive into this foreign land, not only do you deal with issues of how you dealt with the memories of your country of origin, the social changes that you went through, the political changes that you went through, the economic upheaval that you went through, also the cultural situations, both the strengths and the struggles and challenges that you went through. But it also depends on the attitude you have in the society of settlement. The social connections you make, the political upheaval, the Black Lives Matter, the all kinds of things that we've had to go through. The economic upheaval, the racism, the, all the things and attitudes that people have, the polarization. Then you begin to deal with both. And the stresses and the skill deficiencies that you begin to feel that you doubt whether you are who you are, whether the education you got, whether the credentials that you have, when somebody looks at you and says, I don't know what you're talking about and I don't know what school you went to, just because you're black. Then you look at all the characteristics that you've come with, and you begin to wonder when there is a clash of temperament and personality between you and your children and your wife. When you're dealing with language barriers, when you're dealing with acculturation strategies that you have used, some would retreat and become the greatest chinkuru in the world and say, I don't care about this country and I don't want anything to do with this country. They throw away all their Christian names and go back looking for every custom that everything that they can be able to get. And the children are going to the fastest corner and the wife is going to the farthest corner and tensions arise in the family. The amount of time that you've been here, maybe your wife has been here earlier than you and then you come here and he's com she is completely Americanized. Or you come here and your husband is completely Americanized and you are like, who are you? I don't know you anymore. You look at your children and it's like, I don't understand what are you doing that for? What happened to your hair? What happened to your pants? What happened to all these gothic things? I don't understand. And then you begin to go through all these issues and processes of cultural distress. And before long, we have a situation Moses begins to deal with all these issues as he goes to Egypt. And it's until later that God raises up this redeemer to lead the children of Israel out. And God stands to talk to Moses. To remind him again who he is and whose he is. Tonight as I close, I want to ask you a question. As we are going through this crisis, as men and women, as we raise our children, who are we raising them to be? Because they feel as if they are not African enough and they are not American enough. But are we able to stand to remind them who they are and whose they are? This is my prayer this evening. That as God speaks to us this evening, 
God may remind you again who you are and who you are. Moses stands up and he's raised and comes to the mountain of God. And it is there at Horeb that God reminds him who he is and restores the relationship when Jethro brings back Zipporah and his two sons. And Moses, with his renewed family, begins to have a new call to be able to stand up. Not only because of what he had learned in Egypt, that he had to relearn in Sinai, in the desert of Midian, but he has to begin a new learning. So he had to learn, unlearn, and begin the process of learning again. May God make us teachable tonight. That even though we've left the continent and have come to a new land, may we go back to Horeb. That we may meet God a second time. That he may speak life to you. And take you through a baptism of the Red Sea. That you may be able to get a new identity. And a new call. We may be able to stand as ambassadors of Christ. Who have been bought with a price. Who are not citizens of Africa or America. But citizens of the new world. Who knowing that we have a double world view. I am a child of the globe. But a resident of heaven. For I'm a pilgrim going home. Even when sometimes I've been discriminated in both worlds. But I have a new city. And a new land. Where God is the builder and the architect of that city. This is my prayer in Jesus name. Let us pray. Our Father and our God. Tonight we stand before you. Lord. It's been a rough journey, journeying with Moses and seeing the trauma that oozes out of him, that triggers our own pain of unresolved issues, some of which we encountered at home, some of which we encountered en route to this foreign land, and some of which we have encountered here raising our children or under the tutelage of our parents. Or because of racism, because of trauma, because of even cyber bullying and things that nobody else understands. But Lord, tonight, Lord, may we meet with Jesus. Then in our encounter with you in Mount Horeb, the second time we may go through the waters of the Red Sea and be born into a new kingdom and a new race of the redeemed. Then may you send us back to our marriages, to our families, to our parents with a newfound identity as children of the king. That we may stand today and shake off the fears and the anxieties and depressions of the past. Knowing that I have been with God and I have seen him face to face. And he has called me to be his child and to begin a new journey to the celestial city. Speak peace to us tonight. That even as the darkness has covered the face of the earth, oh God, there may be sunshine in my soul. And I may hear a new song singing to the glories of Jehovah. For this is our prayer tonight. To the glory of your name, because we ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. May God bless you. May God be with you until tomorrow. Happy Sabbath.